uh, I want to just talk about what we're going to try to accomplish during the next 45 minutes. Uh, we want to take some time to reflect on how we use technology to engage students. Uh, we want to observe how we can use iPads to explore our course content. Uh, we want to discuss ways in which we can improve student interaction using the technology. We're going to see some videos and some fun stuff. And then uh, finally, because we're mathematicians, we want everyone to gain an appreciation of ma where mathematics occurs in the world around them. So, okay, because uh, we're mathematicians and, and uh, we want you guys to get a little bit of uh, fun math in while we're doing this. Um, where is this, yeah. so, so where is this all coming from? Uh, a, a year ago, you might know that uh, we started an iPad study here at Pepperdine. Uh, basically, if you were teaching two sections of the same course, then you could apply uh, for the iPad study. One of the, your sections would have iPads and the other, ones, the other one would not. And uh, the idea was to look at the learning outcomes at the course and see if the iPad could improve those learning outcomes. Uh, Brian and I have now done a little offshoot of that study as well, and that's what we're mostly going to talk about, which is how the students interact in the classroom. Uh, I taught Calculus for Business and Economics last fall with the iPad, and uh, Brian taught Nature of Mathematics, or is teaching ma Nature of Mathematics right now with the iPad, and I'm also teaching the Calc for Business and Econ with the iPads again this semester. And so what we're going to show you today is a little bit about what we learned during the initial study uh, in the fall and the spring of last year and what we're going to be looking for uh, this fall as we're continuing the study. So I'm going to give it up to Brian. All right. So, um, okay, so we're going to start with a discussion and uh, this is what we do when we teach. We just always discuss things. So um, it's always good to start out thinking what, what kinds of technology are you using and um, the reason is, I mean, iPads are nice. We like them. We, I don't want to pretend like the iPad is the end all of technology, right? In 20 years, there's going to be something newer. So let's just reflect on what we're currently doing and how, how that's working for us in classroom. So what if we just have a few of you raise your hands or something and say, hey, this is, what, this is how I use technology. This is what it's good for. We'll start with, was it Christy? Christy. So, so you mentioned a bunch of stuff. Can I ask how is it that the students engage with this technology and then how, how, how do the students engage with another while using the technology? Fantastic, yeah. Um, someone else. So, so thanks, Christy. You, you can see Christy is, uh, I guess, loves playing with tech toys. There's all sorts of fantastic ideas there. Um, what are some other people doing in their classrooms? Um, what was your name? Anne Maria. Hi, Anne. Thank you. So you're using the technology to access real data and to maybe compile or analyze that, that right. real data. And the students do it together, and so if you have somebody who isn't the most technologically savvy, but they're very good at coming up with questions, because that's what statistics is, it's answering right. questions, then that person is helpful, and then you have the other person who maybe is, is better at the technology side, and then in the end, the difference between statistics and the rest of them, or some of them, is when you get the answer. So why does that matter? <laughs> and so that's how they interact, of course, in general. 
Fantastic. Well, Brian, I would actually love, activity. Yeah, I would love to have everybody answer, but uh, here, take your take your answers and just put it in your mind, and then you answered for yourself. Um, okay. Uh, so for so for us, our so for us, our main interest is um, one. There's technology and students interacting with the technology. But, but for us, a big question is, how does this technology allow students to work together? And I heard that in both of your responses, that you're interested not in just students sitting here in front of a computer, but how is it that students can bring, can bring a different dimension of interaction in your classroom? And that's what we're really interested in. And so for us, we spend some time kind of brainstorming different ways in which technology can be used and different ways in which students interact together. And we decided to draw little diagrams to illustrate it. And so one of our first illustrations is what we call students working in isolation. And this is something you probably see a lot in a classroom. You, everybody flips up their, tap, their laptop and they work in isolation. So here you can see a student is trying to work on mathematics using the technology, engaging with mathematics. This student is engaging a technology to work on mathematics. But notice there's not a lot of interaction going on here. And we have some other pictures. Is that on the next slide? Well, they were right? going to try to draw. Oh, are we going to do the drawing activity yeah. first? Okay. Let's do a couple of those. So one thing we wanted you guys to do is open up your iPads and get to the Jot app. It should have Jot with an exclamation mark. I guess it means you are really excited about it. And open it up. And what I would like you guys to do is think a little bit about how technology is working in your classroom and how students are engaging, one, with the technology, and two, with one another. And see if you can draw a little diagram that illustrates how technology is, is being used in your classrooms. And send that email to Tim, tlucas at pepperdine.edu, and we'll get it, and we'll laugh at it. Yeah, once you've got one, just go ahead and email it to me. See if we can get some. The email's already set up on the program. Yeah, I guess there should be a little button in the corner or something that you can just click it and it'll email the picture automatically for you. Uh, as an image is best. Yeah. Yeah, and just draw something that, that, that represents how students interact with technology in your classroom. You can clear the page by hitting the trash button, I believe, is what. Yeah. yeah. I think it tells you to do that. Very nice. I just downloaded it. Oh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so if you want to clear this page, you can just hit the little trash button. It'll empty it out. Would you like all that, all those pictures are gone? To, to me. Hit that, to hit that little trash button. It can clear. It can get you, you a, a clean page to work on if you want. Now you can. Now you can do it. Yeah. So here, so hit the trash, and then, ju and then just hit delete, and it'll clear the page. So now you've got a blank page to work with. It's not what? It's not Tim.Lucas. Uh, you can do a keyboard or you could just write with your finger if you like. You just like to write some words. No, it won't. Or draw a picture or Timothy something. Timothy works, but he, Tim doesn't. Yeah. No, no, it's just T. And then just hit. No, hit send. Do you start pulling up a couple of the ones that we've got? Yeah, I don't think we're going to have very many. Oh, good, good. And that one looks like that might be good too. So go ahead and send that, and then. T Lucas at Pepperdine.edu. That's Tim's email, but he's the one running everything. So Timothy Lucas also works. Yeah, Timothy Lucas also works, but T Lucas, L U C A S at pepperdine.edu. Oh, I, I love the heart. <laughs> yeah, and then you... And you You're all using the wireless at once. It's kind of fun that way. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's working faster. 
Just so you know, math is not a spectator sport. Right? <laughs> Hopefully we'll get to a serious one. Let's see. I have no idea what that is. Oh, means. fantastic. Would somebody tell me what this picture is? Sure. Okay. Little docs or students. Okay. okay. And they're in front of their computers. Okay. Via, via, do they interact with the instructor via the computer or just via conversation? Okay. And then they see the screen of what the instructor is doing. They're trying to follow and then they work with each other. Okay. All right. So you put them in groups with them working on computers together and then they okay. interact with the teacher and they have a screen in front. Fantastic. Fantastic. That sounds a lot like some of the stuff we do. So some of the videos we'll see are a similar type of model. Um, someone's playing the drums. <laughs> This is what happens when you let people... Well, so <laughs> somebody's upset that the technology won't work. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> very, very nice. Yeah, it's called the cursor. I like, I like that quote. All right. <laughs> well, well, thanks. So, so this is a hard assignment, actually. I mean, I mean you, we spent a long time kind of creating some of our models, but... But this, we, is, this is kind of the thing we're looking. Yeah, this is good. We're kind of looking we, for. We we thought it would be good for you just to spend a moment brainstorming, saying how how does technology work in my classroom? How how do students interact with this technology? Before we start telling you some of the things that we noticed in our classrooms, and so um, we have a couple more pictures, don't we? Yes. And so here's a couple of things that. Here's a couple of images that we came up with when we were doing our brainstorming, and these are things that might happen in a classroom. These are things that actually don't don't happen a lot in our classrooms because we use slightly different format. But, but one, this is where you've got a teacher and a teacher is dispensing a bunch of information using technology. So, the te so it's kind of a one-way route. This might be um, what's happening right now with the projector, mm -hmm. right? We have a bunch of people out here, we're dispensing our information and technology is kind of the avenue allowing us to do that. It might be what happens when we send an email or something like that. Um, beyond, let's see, what, what is this picture? This picture is um, maybe where everyone's working working collaboratively on one problem. So, um, like Google what, Doc. yeah, like a Google Doc or something where you've got maybe one sort of central hub where everybody's collaborating on one project and they're all being connected to that via, via some sort of technology. Um, we don't tend to do those a lot in our classroom. That doesn't mean that we don't like them. It just, you know, doesn't always fit what we're trying to do. So a lot of things we noticed were these types of interactions. Because we tend to do something very much like um, was mentioned over here with the, the students working in groups with their laptops. And so we tend to see students, one, working a lot in isolation. That is, they tend to get wrapped up in their laptop, kind of live there, and, and not, not communicate outside of it. Um, sometimes we get students, we get two students who are working in isolation, but they occasionally peek over at each other and say, I got 12, what did you get? Right? And so it's kind of this verifying thing that's going on. But what we really like is when we see something a little bit more than that happen. And so that's something like a picture like this might illustrate, where one teacher, one, one student is maybe assisting the other student in their technology. So maybe now that we've only got one avenue of technology and the two students are working together to help, to help understand how, how the mathematics view the technology. And this is when we get really excited. And that's when we have the students and they're each kind of using their own technology, but they're collaborating in the process. And so that is they're they're each working together to develop kind of this similar notion of what mathematics is, rather than them working completely isolated from each other and just occasionally verifying answers. They're working together to achieve the same goal, right? And it's that they've got kind of the same ideas in mind and the technology is allowing them to access some different forms of mathematics. So at this point, I think well, I we're going to- I was going to say one oh, thing. Oh, okay. Which is, uh, so with these kinds of interactions that you're seeing right here, we're actually gonna, we have someone who's sitting and observing my class this fall looking for these kinds of interactions amongst the groups to try to figure out uh, whether we see more of, say, two and three than, they see, than we see of one in our, in our iPad classes. So that's what we're kind of looking at. That sounds like something coming from the law school, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. Like, get on GChat, I'm fine with if someone helps you get the answer, it yeah. gets you to the right place. Right. Um, because the answer isn't really what I'm looking for. Once they give me the answer, oh, it's on page 7. Right. There's going to be a follow-on question that's not on page 7. <laughs> they don't right, right. Yeah, no, that's right, and and I think you know you make a lot of points, um, and, and I think we're kind of the same way. At first, when I first started teaching, and granted, I'm not that old, but when I first started teaching, it was kind of unusual to have students, you know, link up via technology or something. But now, I kind of get excited about that because that means these students are communicating with each other. It means they're helping each other, they're investing in each other, and then and then from that, they're learning something. So I'd much rather have students linking up and trying to help each other learn. Than, than a picture, you know, than, than having, you know, them all just kind of working in their own little bubble, isolated from each other. Um, okay, so we're going to spend a little bit of time learning some mathematics. Okay, who here is excited about learning mathematics? All right, right. great. That's not yes, usual. that's why, that's why we, that's why you came to this session and not the other one, probably. Um, so what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about chaotic events. Um, everybody's heard of chaos theory. What movie did we hear about chaos theory from? Jurassic Park. Right. How old is Jurassic Park? 18 years. So, so, so think of it this way. Jurassic Park came out the year our freshman students were born. So this is not a good example for them. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I mentioned this in class today. The students hadn't seen Jurassic Park. I thought, what's wrong here? You know? Because it was such kind of... <laughs> yeah, they've, been, they've been on their bride. Yeah. Isn't there a ride called Jurassic Park? Um, but, but it's talking about chaotic events. And the point of chaotic events is that they're not random. And so I'll give you a little math background. So we tend to think when we hear something's chaotic, we think, well, it's just random, you know, we, we can't understand it. That's actually not true. A chaotic event is something that's predetermined based on whatever the initial conditions go, that go into it. So it, weather is a wonderful example because the weather is going to rain or it's going to shun, sun, or be sunny or it's going to be windy or whatever based on what conditions go in to make the weather. Well, what makes it chaotic is that just the very smallest, slightest change to those conditions can have drastic impacts on the overall set of the system. And this is how we define, define chaos. And so that's kind of the whole picture that, that, uh, that uh, the, the guy's talking about in Jurassic Park where he's talking about the butterfly flapping his wings and it's changing the weather somewhere else. What he's saying is that very small uh, perturbation of, of the initial conditions makes a drastic change somewhere down the line to the whole system. And so what we're going to do is I want you all to open up numbers on your, on your spreadsheet. And what you're going to have is you're going to have a spreadsheet that allows you, we, we set up the calculation for you. Of course, in class, we would force our students to make, kind of make the spreadsheet do this computation itself. But, but we're, we have it set up for you. So open up numbers. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with initial value. So we're going to start with 1.2. And then we're going to do something with that number. We're going to square it and then we're going to subtract 1.2. And then we're going to square the answer and subtract 1.2. And square the answer and subtract 1.2. And square the answer and subtract 1.2. And we're going to keep doing this until we get sick and tired of it, basically. And so you can see why a spreadsheet would be great for this. Because right? a spreadsheet, that's what spreadsheets do. They compute things and, and do the same thing over and over and over again. So, uh, so we're going to walk around and try to help you do this. And what I would like you to do is look at that spreadsheet. Have you guys been successful at pulling it up? Yeah, that's all you need. That's all you need okay. is, is a list of numbers. Oh, the 11.2 is at the top, so you might need to scroll to the top. So okay. here the initial condition is that 1.2 is kind of the seed that's going into this process where we're squaring and subtracting, squaring and subtracting, squaring and subtracting. And so uh, what I would like you guys to do is look down through this process and see if you notice anything interesting happening as we square and, square and subtract repeatedly and repeatedly. Adam notices something interesting. What's interesting, Adam? So what's the pattern? One seven one, and then what does it do? Uh, it goes negative and uh, it between Yeah, so so it eventually ends up bouncing between two numbers, right? One seven one, and what's it up? Is it negative point one point one seven? So it ends up bouncing back and forth between two numbers. So you can kind of see how there's a pattern that emerges out of this thing. Now what I want you to do is change the initial conditions ever so slightly. And that is, go to where the, the, the 1.2 is and just change that number 
to other numbers. Choose numbers between 0 and 2 or else you'll get stuff that really don't make any sense. But you know, change those initial conditions slightly and see what happens to your results. And more than that, see if you can find any sort of patterns among these results. See if you can look at like different. Oh, so you just click on it. Twice. Double tap. Yeah, double tap it. Double tap the number. And then once you've done that, hit enter. Oh, there you check go. And it'll allow you, and go to the equal sign. Yeah. Once go to you've the equal done sign. That, you can hit double. And it'll allow you to just retype whatever new number you and want in its place. Oh, because it does show it when you tap it twice. That one. I mean, if you want to tap it. Yeah, so pick numbers between 0 and 2 and look for patterns and kind of say, what, what sort of yeah, conclusions you could you we draw about this chaotic system? You guys pick point nine, something happened. And really try to pick a very, you know, vary your numbers up. And see what kind of patterns you might get. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> you tried one point three. Um, yeah, you could, you can probably make your own. If so, so you let's go down. You have to kind of go down to the bottom. Um, let's see. Did the did the formula get? So you get a did negative one. Oh, so I think the formula is okay. Point three eight. I'll do this. I think I just changed that. Negative one point three eight. I'll see if I can fix it. I'm clever. Four numbers are possible. This is what. Oh, come on. Oh, you wanna you wanna change just this one? Yeah, this is not behaving nice. Oh, here we go. This is how I always do it. There are other ways to do it. I yeah. just do a fill. And yeah, here, I think I mean, two may be really out. big, and that may be why it's kind of why it's kind of acting strange. But maybe try like maybe one point done. something. And now you've got a different pattern. So what you should notice is is that it, it's <coughs> repeating like every. Well, it's hard to determine. Yeah, and hit here, enter on that it, and see if that does. You do get a repetition. Yeah. So notice that. So now you got something that's actually computing again. out. And you can look thing. and see what does that do. What'd you get? <coughs> yeah, so that one's, but it's still it's still two numbers, right? It's still two numbers. Yeah, this one's still repeating. It's yeah. just taking um, longer. Yeah. But keep trying stuff and see if you notice kind of sort of uh, yeah. patterns emerging. And make sure you share your results with your neighbors. Are we good? How's our time? Let's, let's be good. I think we should. Okay, kind of. I think they've kind of got it. Okay. So okay, so let's so let's have some conversation. Was that fun? Oh right. So somebody maybe not. Okay, maybe somebody found it fun. Did anyone did anyone notice anything interesting in in what happens with the different seeds that you can put into this to this squaring and subtracting pattern? Uh, oh well, well. We'll do that. Yes. 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 You are you are to the next slide already. Okay, very good, very good. <laughs> um, did, did anyone notice any sort of interesting things happening? Um, what, what are the numbers? What numbers you used? So when you used 1.8, it bounced between three different numbers. So so all of a sudden, instead of having two numbers that it that it that it rotated between, it had three numbers it was rotating between. Um, did anyone else get anything? Adam. When I put point one. Uh, point one. So it just goes to only one number if you pick point one. So we've got so we've got some places here where it goes to two numbers, some places where it goes to three, somewhere it goes to one. Did anybody get anything else? Oh. So yeah, so is there some where there's like no recognizable pattern? It just seems to do un unknown stuff for a while. And that's right. And so um, so I'm, gonna show the picture. I'm not sure I know your name over here, but you suggested that we. What was that? Farhad. Okay, so Farhad suggested that um, we look at a picture, and if you take every possible seed and put it in here and then plot the results, this is the picture you get. Isn't that kind of cool? So here's our 1.2 right here, and here's our negative 1.17 and like our 0.7 or whatever those two values were. And so if you look up here, so here's the 1.8. 1.8 is kind of an anomaly because it hits three, it's, it's like a mug here, there's a lot of crazy stuff, but 1.8 is a special number that actually works. Um, if you pick, if you pick, so, so here, so if you go to like 0.1, you get just one number. Over here you get two. If you pick between 1.2 and 1.4, you might get four numbers. And then if you pick something like right here, as Luisa said, it, it's just crazy. You know, you get all sorts of stuff. But what's amazing is that out of this seemingly chaotic event, an, an event to where you just slightly change the, the initial conditions, you get wild, rapid differences in the results. 
there's kind of this amazing beauty to this chaotic event that somehow when you plot all these together, you get this picture, which is really a, a pretty beautiful picture. I don't know if you all agree, but I, this, right. this is what I get excited about. All right, it's more, more beautiful picture. So, so, what was that? Yeah, maybe we should. <laughs> so these are part of a larger mathematical phenomenon called fractals, and fractals are, um, are, are objects that have self-similarity. This is a famous fractal. It's called the Sierpinski Triangle. This is another famous fractal called a cucumber, or not a cucumber, a cauliflower. Uh, it's actually a special type of cauliflower. I don't remember its fancy name. I should, but I don't remember it. And when there's too many people in, front, in a room, you can't remember anything. But right? they, they, if you zoom in, you'll see something that looks Yeah, Yeah, but what's important similar. is the self-similarity, right? So if we look at this little triangle, this little triangle is the same as the large triangle, right? So, so, and then if you look at this little cauliflower, it's the same as the big cauliflower. So if you zoom in, you get the same shape repeating, repeated with zooming. And so the most famous fractal is this one. It's called the Mandelbrot set. And, the, and I'm guessing a lot of you have seen this picture before. Is that right? So it's a very famous fractal. How is this fractal formed? It's actually formed by squaring and subtracting, just like we did this, 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 uh, this pr uh, exercise a little bit earlier. Um, the only difference is instead of squaring and subtracting uh, numbers between 0 and 2, we're squaring and subtracting uh, complex numbers. So you would take, you take an imaginary you know, an imaginary real number added together, and then you would use that for your squaring and subtracting mm -hmm. process. But what I would like you to do is open up the Fractile Plus app. Do you have Fractile Plus somewhere, hopefully? And what you're going to find in Fractile Plus is you're going to find a really pretty picture of this, of the Mandelbrot set. Is that correct? Yeah. Can you see it? And you know what's really neat about this? You can zoom in and zoom out with your fingers, kind of doing the pinch pull, and you can explore this Mandelbrot set. So, so if I come here, and I decide to zoom in on something, say so this. You've got to use a, a, pinch, a pinch and push motion here to, to zoom say in. I, say I zoom in right here, and say I zoom in on this little black square here, what do I notice? I notice that we get the same picture back. And so why don't you just spend a couple of minutes, this is a cool app, and this is something we let our students do. Just play with it and notice the, the intricate detail and the self-similarity of the Mandelbrot set. That one's easy to get down. My son loves this app. Okay. For, for discussing what kind of okay, sounds great. All right, so while you're playing with that app, um, we did all this math stuff. Well, we, we did all this math stuff for two reasons, okay? So the first reason we did the math stuff is because we're kind of like math evangelists in a way, and it's that we always think people should be learning more mathematics. Um, but, there's <laughs> but there's actually a second reason. It's because we're interested in how people interact with each other using iPads. And so we thought, what better way for us to open up the discussion than for you all to interact with each other using an iPad? And so what I would like to hear from you sitting, sitting here right now is, what ways did you, did you see the iPad was either useful or, or maybe a hindrance towards you all working together or you all exploring mathematics together in groups? So does anybody have any, any uh, observation that, that you've made through the last 10 or 15 minutes? David. So David's a big, big fan of kind of the uh, colors, right? Bright colors. <laughs> no. <laughs> Was, was, that a, was that a good summary? No, <laughs> no, no but, but you're right. But there's something about having students involved. Of course, you can have students involved with a piece of paper too, right? But, um, but maybe the iPad allows you to access things you can't access with a piece of paper. Oh, do you guys notice any differences between using an iPad and maybe using a traditional laptop or some, some other form of technology? So you're closer to the iPad, you're closer to the person you're working with, or? Mm -hmm. so, so maybe maybe the tactile nature of working with iPad. And, and, and so, so speak for a second about closer to the people you're working with. Did you all feel that in any case, that maybe it was easier to work with someone than when you're using a laptop? Um, you know, let's, so Christy? So 
So it's something about the, the light, maybe the, the, the portability of, of, of a laptop that's nice. Was there? So you can actually interact with your neighbor's with your neighbor's iPad sometimes, right? You can actually reach over and interact with it, and and that didn't like destroy the whole cohesiveness of the group. Is that right? Did I hear one more thought? So maybe so it's easy to work on independently and share simultaneously. Whereas maybe a laptop, it'd be hard to do those two simultaneously. Maybe the laptop, you can work independently or you can share, but it's hard to do, do the two activities at the same time. We have one, one last thought. Oh, okay. So one, one last thought. Maybe you, maybe it's there's a, a less of a learning curve, or maybe a larger ability to create inside of an app. That's a, I, I guess I hadn't thought about that. That's a, that's an interesting idea. Maybe we'll have to tease that out mm -hmm. sometime. All okay, right. so I'm going to hand over to Dr. Lucas. Oh. I I I try to encourage people to share. Uh, I mean, uh, so I'm teaching the business class. I try to tell people that they're going to have to interact with people eventually. Yeah, but I, I mean, I'm saying that they're going to have to interact with somebody at some point in their life, you know, so this, this is something they've got to do. But uh, you can't get everyone to share. You, and uh, some... Yeah, I, I'm not, I, just, I oh. try to get people to open up, but I also don't force it too much either. I, I yeah. mean, if people are working well independently, I'm not going to force it on them. And but if if that's hindering others in the group, I encourage them the next day to find a different group so that they can they can have that interaction. Yeah. But so, you know, so I, as long as you're learning, you're good. Yeah, All right, so, so, so I'm going to agree with Tim here. I'm not an iron hand either. Um, the one thing I would say I, I I do do is if I'm looking if a student has a question. I'll say, have you asked your group members yet? And if they say no, then I go, maybe you should start there, right? And so that's kind of one way. But if, if the students, Tim's right, I mean, if the student's working well and being successful, then I, I guess I'm not going to throw a fit. I'm not going to come down and, you know, beat them on the head or something. Oh, I see, I see a bunch of disagreement, so, uh, well, or maybe not. Do we have time for disagreement? I, I just want to, I, I want to be able to, <laughs> I, I want to be sensitive <laughs> to people's time on, on, on that, because I think that's going to open up a whole new can of worms. Of okay. Okay, we'll take one question. You, no, you can be fast, right? Uh, yeah, I want to agree with you right there. I, I <laughs> and this is the end. I okay. spend a lot of my life as a programmer banging out code for a living, and I do have an MBA, but you know what? Sometimes the best way for a program to get done is for everybody to get the hell out of my office, <laughs> and I'm going to be the best way to get the hell out of my office. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna shut going. down. I've got to, I gotta do something. So okay, everyone who's interested in arguing over this over lunch, raise your hand. 
And then we can find each other. So uh, <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to uh, a lot of the observations that you just made, I was going to try to get you to make again with these videos. But since you made them, I'm just going to talk through them because we have a, a limited amount of time. This is my class last year. With uh, we're doing, a, we're working in groups on an activity, and they've all got laptops and they're using Excel. They're doing a lot of stuff with spreadsheets uh, in this in this business calculus class. And I'm going to show these clips, and I want you to see how these students are working together. You've got students trying to work together with laptops. You've got a lot of leaning going on, and as I'm going to play this one simultaneously, so that you can see that this student here actually gets up out of her chair. She's got to walk around to another student and start trying to teach them how to do it. She can't use her own laptop to help others out. And then you can see also on the left that way in the corner over here, these people are just kind of out of it. They just, they're not really, they're not doing anything. I mean, they're just sitting there looking at Facebook. I think uh, Janet spent the whole time trying to figure out what that kid in the corner was doing. She was like, what is he doing because he's not doing math? <laughs> So <laughs> this is kind of what our laptop section looked like uh, during that day. And, it, and this corner kind of persisted throughout the class. Um, the, uh, the iPad section looks a lot different. Um, these students are, are working together on a problem. You've got uh, one student demonstrating. They picked up the iPad, just like someone said, and showed it to their neighbors. Uh, at some point, you've got two students who are working together. Uh, and they're tapping each other's iPads. It's going to come up in a second. Uh, one, of course, we got another demonstration that's going here so that students can see what's going on. So they're really working together in, in groups. And this is kind of the, the difference between the classes that we noticed as we were, as we were uh, uh, going through the semester. Uh, you, I think at some point you might have seen someone start to tap someone else's iPad. Why don't you try this? Try tapping this. So that was kind of the, di the difference we saw in how people worked. Um, I'm going to bring up some comments from the students. So this is the pictures between the two classes. The top ones are the iPads. The bottom ones are the laptops. My favorite being the guy leaning over there. Um, the, the, the iPad group told, talked about how they wanted to help each other out a lot, uh, make sure that they were all on the same page. It was easier when they could pass the iPad. Uh, and they found that it was, you were more, more likely to help each other when it's portable and you could see what everyone else was doing. That's what they found uh, when they were commenting on the class. Um, the other group, the other laptop group was really kind of funny because uh, the, one of these people that's in this photo, and I know it, it is because I know who's in the focus group, said this. We meet outside of class in our groups to do the homework. It's not really group work in class. And you can see they're sitting in class and in groups. And yet they couldn't understand that they were working in groups in class. And I know it's, got, it's one of the people that's in this group right here that said it, because I knew who was in the focus group. So um, another thing we noticed was that uh, we have uh, these uh, single arm desks in this room so that we can fit enough students in. And uh, they had no space to work when they were working with their laptops. This guy's working. He's kind of on, on his lap trying to write stuff because he's got uh, his laptop. Uh, on, on his desk. And so it, they were talking about how it was a big hassle juggling all their stuff. Um, I'm going to keep on going. Uh, so we brought some of the students in and did a little interview with them. Uh, we asked them to solve the same problem. Uh, and we asked actually four different groups to kind of solve the same problem. It was kind of a culmination problem for the course. And uh, I'm going to play this video so that you can see how the, uh, these groups work together uh, on this problem. So. Uh, this is a laptop group. You'll notice that there's no laptop. They didn't even think to open it up. They did bring it, but they didn't think to open it up. And they're just standing, staring at the board, and they're doing a lot of computations by hand on the board. We're talking adding fractions and doing all sorts of things. Oh, good. That's not really that low on battery power. Um, that's kind of what they did. Uh, about 20 minutes later, uh, when they were working on this problem, they thought, aha, I could get my laptop out and I could make a graph and do some other things. Uh, that's, that's when they finally started doing this. And then they started working mostly independently. One of them didn't ever get his laptop out. The other one's having to lean over and share and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, but they wor started working kind of independently uh, and started talking independently. They stopped working as a group. It was kind of interesting. Um, when, uh, when the, uh, when the iPad group got up and started working. It was 
the iPad was chained to their hand and they were ready to go. And they were starting to do things on the board and use the iPad to help them kind of uh, sketch graphs. They went to graphs immediately for, for, for a problem and instead of kind of working out everything by hand just so they could visualize what was going on. And so we saw that kind of stuff. And uh, the last one was, uh, you could see that they all started kind of working together. One guy's holding it, the other guy's saying, well, why don't you try doing this and, and, and see what you can do with the iPad. So they're kind of working more collectively, is what we noticed. And they got their iPads out immediately and started working with it. It didn't take them 20 minutes. They thought, ah, oh, we should get some pictures going. We should, we should do some other things. Um, so uh, that's kind of uh, what, those, these are the kinds of things that we're going to be doing again this fall. We're gonna, we're, we've got people who are uh, doing observations and kind of trying to figure out how people are interacting. We're going to bring them back and do some small group uh, interviews and see, and see how the students interact while they're trying to solve uh, a, a, a major problem that they have to work on during the course. Um, so uh, Brian's going to finish this up talking about kind of transforming learning spaces. Yeah, so, um, well, one of the interesting, so I like this quote, by the way. Uh, we found this in someone who's talking about different spaces in which students learn. They said, laptops seem to add a picket fence between you and your students. I don't know if you experienced this. All students flip up with the iPad, the, the laptops, and all of a sudden, it's like there's a wall there. And, um, you know, we're in areas of, of mathematics that uh, frequently we want the students using technology because, you can access different problems. You, you, can, you can kind of engage with different ideas using technology than not. So there's kind of this debate. How do I have them engaging technology but not have them shut off behind the picket fence? And for us, the, lap, the, the iPad has been useful. I mean, I'm not, you know, we're not here to argue that the iPad is the end all of devices, but, but for us, it's been good, right? For us, it's been good. Um, one thing, oh, we maybe talked I'll, about a lot of these questions already. Yeah, maybe I'll just throw out a little, an a little anecdotal point that, uh, is, is kind of a side note of this. Um, when when uh, individuals, when, when Janet and Dana were observing at different, uh, different iPad and non-iPad classrooms, they just kind of noticed on the side that the laptop classes were much more likely to be surfing the web, checking email, working on Facebook, and the iPad classes were much less likely to be doing that. And I really feel like maybe this is part of the reason. I feel like maybe when you get that laptop up, you feel like you're in your own world. It's you and the computer, and I can do what I want because I'm in my own world. And so if I want to listen, I can. If I want to play on Facebook, I can. Whereas when you have the iPad open, you're not in your own world. You're still in the classroom. And I think maybe there was something going on there. So, so for us, we've been really interested in talking about learning spaces and the differences between the types of spaces that take place in the classroom. Um, one way in which I describe it is I say whenever you're working in a group, there are actually two types of spaces. There are your private spaces that you work on individually. And then there are public spaces that you're sharing with other people. And um, most often with a laptop, your private space is the laptop. And the only thing that's public are any words you might shout out over the top of your laptop to your neighbor. Whereas whenever you're with an iPad, the private space is your, I is your iPad or your paper just the same as it was with the laptop? But if you want to share that, if you want to make that space public, you can lean over to your neighbor. You can pick it up. You can show it. And, and so the ability to share private spaces uh, you know, has been enhanced quite a bit by our iPad classes. And so when I look at these questions, I kind of say, well, what, what features uh, of the learning space are changed? And I think that's one of the big features, the difference between being able to share your, your private work publicly in a group. Um, another, so, so we asked, what are the characteristics of the iPad? And I think this is an essential question because what we'd really like is we'd like to understand learning better so that whenever, 10 years from now, when the iPad's obsolete, we still learn something, right, about learning. So just to say the iPad's better isn't near as useful as saying what is it about the iPad that mm -hmm. helps. And so for us, we think the real, um, we're still trying to pin this down, but for me, I think maybe the real characteristics of the iPad that are, that are, that are nice are one, the portability, the ability to kind of be able to share, be able to, uh, to pass back and forth the device. And that's simultaneous with the fact that the screen size is large enough you can look at it. Because this is the same, this, this thing is, is the same with a calculator, but calculators, again, tend to be very private, very individual devices. So for me, the big difference is whether this device kind of lives in you, you know, it's a personal device, or whether it's a device that's equipped to being shared. So in the future, when, I'm, you know, when the iPad's gone, and I'm looking for new devices, I'm going to be asking myself this question. Is this a device that's going to be an individual device, or is this a device that has the capacity to be shared in some fashion? 
Um, um, so we're going to finish up right now because I see that, that they've got to get the next session oh. going on. <laughs> but we do want to thank uh, Tim Chester is the one who got this whole iPad study started. And we want to thank him. And Dana and Hong and Janet have all worked in, uh, with the iPad study in one way or another. And so we want to thank them. Especially uh, Janet got all your iPads set up today so that we could, uh, you guys could have some fun with them. So please return your iPads up to the front with, uh, with Janet. And then uh, we're going to kind of head out of here real quick so we can get the next session started. And my understanding is if you're interested in checking out an iPad, you should go over to the hands-on workshop and talk to them. And they'll tell you, you know, what you need to do to check out one to explore to see if it's something you might want to use in your class. Thank you, guys. And we'd be more than willing to talk during lunch or something if people want to talk about more, more things that we didn't get to.